Greetings, weary travelers, to the Crypt of the Unknown, the podcast that discusses the fantastic and horrific in all forms of media. I am Webb the Critical Android, and joining me for this episode, he is my friend, he is my compatriot, we don't live in the same village, but he certainly knows his way around it, it's Stefan JD. Stop shouting, you'll draw the monsters. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up down there, try to talk up here. <laughs> ah, or what was it? You're the child's father. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. We are talking about Resident Evil Village, the eighth mainline installment in the Resident Evil franchise from Capcom. And for those of you who have tuned into previous episodes, we recently covered uh, the last release, even though it wasn't a chronological release, it was just the least, latest game that was published when we covered Resident Evil 3, the remake for the PS4 and other modern consoles at the time. And this time around, we're talking about, well, Village, which is the direct sequel to 2017's Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. And I think we need to start off, before we dive into discussing 8, I would say, and maybe you would... I'm not sure if you'd agree with me, because we don't discuss these things ahead of time, but I think it's important to hit that spontaneity. I, I would say that Resident Evil 8 is the first game in the franchise to where you really do need to play the one before to get a full grasp of what's happening. You know, I thought about that a lot. Um, I think someone could still get a basic enjoyment out of it, uh, just for the game alone. But narratively... Yeah, I think you might need, like, a little bit of context. Um, I think the game does offer, like, a, hey, last time on Resident Evil, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Piccolo used his special beam cannon to punch a <laughs> hole right through Ethan and severed his hand. <laughs> Goku was welcomed into the family. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> it does... <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, what's for dinner? <laughs> he's not eating it. He's not eating it, Jack. No, he's eating all of it. I don't understand that. Nobody's ever done that before. <laughs> yeah, this tastes so, yummy. <laughs> I think it does require a little bit of context. Other than that, though, I think you could still enjoy the story because it, it does get a little crazy. Yeah, but the other thing that struck me about that, too, is I think this is also the first mainline game in the series, if we don't count six, because six was an amalgamation of so many things, but this mm. is the first time we actually have a direct sequel with the same character as in the previous numbered installment. Yes and no, but basically yes. Yeah, I mean, if you don't count... Let's say, well, in one, we had Jill and Chris. In two, we had Chris and Leon. In three, which was a side story, technically. Uh, Claire and Leon, but yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, Claire and Leon in two. Um, three, we had Jill going solo. Well, I guess we also had fucking Carlos. Uh, <laughs> four, we go back to Leon, but before four, we had Code Veronica, where we had Claire and, oh, what's his name? And you said Code Veronica? Yeah. Steve. Steve, Steve Burnside. Steve Burn. Yeah, who, no, who cares about Steve? No one <laughs> Claire. likes you, Steve. <laughs> yeah. And then from four to five, we had Leon and four. Five, we have... Chris and Shiva. Six, we have, like, everybody. And then seven and eight, we have Ethan. And I think that's really the only direct sequel kind of, like, carryover we've had in the franchise. And that provides for something really interesting and that we actually have more of a character arc here that we get to take as a whole without it being broken up and segmented in, in the series. Right. Um, I think my only gripe is that you know, and this is this is going back to classic days of how you would uh, treat a character that was more. How should I say this? Uh, they really didn't have a personality, which is kind of what Ethan ha doesn't have in the first game. I mean, there's moments, but right. overall, he's not like a fully uh, circular character. There's no like real arc to it. It's just kind of you're following along, and it's mostly you. And then in this game. And I go back to Dead Space for this, because Dead Space 1 was the same way. Isaac Clarke didn't say a goddamn word, really. And then in 2, it's like, okay, I understand exactly who Isaac Clarke is. In this game, I'm going to say that Ethan doesn't make that jump, but he comes close. I would agree with you. He does not make that full jump to 
um, an understandable, developed character. I mean, he we, we comprehend his motivation, but mm. his motivation is, I want my daughter back. And, yeah. and that's, that's basically it. He just wants to save his daughter, and he doesn't care about anything else that's happening. And I, I get the fact that still, because it's first person, he's kind of meant to be a player avatar, which is why we never see his face. But at the same time, Resident Evil has always been about the personalities in there, aside from the horror. Like, even from the first game, even though it was not intended because of the poor voice acting, but because of the poor voice acting, we really got these very memorable characters. <laughs> I mean, without them intentionally meaning it, some of those lines are just still memes today. Uh, Jill Sandwich, Barry saying, I hope this isn't Chris's... I mean, it's a lot of Barry, too. Yes, it's, it's, it's mostly <laughs> Barry. We all love it's Barry. Most, yeah, it's mostly Barry. But there's also, like, a couple weird ones, like Wesker saying he's going to make the stars his pigs or something. I don't know. But it, it was inherently bad uh, just for the time period. But it was also great because it was memorable for that. And what we got afterwards made total sense. Now, going back to Ethan, I, I think the only things that stuck out to me about his character were the one-liners after he would defeat a head of the house, mm -hmm. uh, a boss of the game. Other than that, I mean, can you recall, like, moments other than him, like, having a limb torn off or something? Like, what was what was his character, you know? Uh, well, his character was... A little Silent Hill. <laughs> uh, yeah, a little Silent Hill. I mean, that's another thing that I guess you could say that Village does, is that it, it's kind of very Silent Hill-ish in some ways. I mean, you got... Uh, we don't want to go too much into plot details right now. But the fact that it does take place in a village and there is kind of a, a cult of sorts, all, automatically that puts you right in Silent Hill territory. Like, it, all you need, like, recipe for Silent Hill. If you, like, opened up a cookbook and said, oh, I'm going to make a Silent Hill today, okay? I need mm -hmm. a cult. Check. Creepy town. Check. Dead people. And check. Okay. And those are the three main ingredients for a Silent Hill. Yeah. And being, like, drawn to the town because of something they probably did that was either good or bad. Oh, but drawn, yeah. Drawn to a town because my daughter's there, and check. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like a retread of Silent Hill by any means. It, it does feel like a retread of something else, and we're going to get to that later on. At least to me, it did. And I guess the, the thing that most people would mention, and I wrote a review that incorporated a lot of this for NerdBot, nerdbot.com. You can read my review there. And... The thing that's great about this podcast here is that we have two people, myself and and Stefan, who have beaten this game. But it's coming from the perspective of myself, who plays a lot of Resident Evils, but not enough to master them, versus somebody who has actively platinum trophied pretty much every game in the franchise. Yeah, and I should mention this. Um, right now I'm at, like, I don't know, 60% trophies or something for RE8. Um, the thing about that and the difficulty settings is I always look forward to the hardest setting just because I know I'm going to do it once. I'm not a lunatic that likes to do it over and over again. I just like to challenge myself for that one time. But yes, I do have all the Platinums for every RE. The, another thing I want to mention, though, Webb, before we go on, is that your review on NerdBot, I actually, when I read it, I pretty much agreed with 90% of it. So if people are curious... I think he actually did cover a pretty good amount. And the cool thing, too, is that, like, I, I don't really read a lot of uh, uh, re online reviews outside of web stuff and, like, Game Informer because I just I didn't know them so closely. They're on my friends list and everything. But shout outs to GI. But, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I appreciated your review. And not only that, but you actually do have, like, oh, we're not getting to the spoilers yet section. So. That was cool. Yeah, I feel like when covering a game like this, since it's not a very scary game, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit too, the element of surprise in terms of like what to expect is what makes this game compensate for the scares. And if you, you get too much information about that, about what to expect, then... You know, it, it ruins part of that surprise factor. And I didn't want to do that to anybody going into this game. I didn't want to tell them too much about the settings of where they would go. Because 
it you need to take that journey for yourself to appreciate this game in a way that you're only going to be able to appreciate it that first time. So I try to avoid talking about most of it aside from the mechanical elements of it. And I think that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to discuss some very basic mechanical issues or things about the game. And then yeah. we can go from there to discussing the story elements, and we'll warn you before we hit those. And we're going to do gradual spoiler increasing. We're going to start with just talking about mechanics, and then we're going to move into talking about more of the game itself and where you go, and then we're going to go scene by scene through this game and really break things down. Uh, so to cover the mechanics pretty quick here, it's basically Resident Evil 7, but in more open territory as opposed to the closed territories that we found in the first first person Resident Evil, not counting Gun Survivor and Dead Aim. <laughs> We're not counting those. If we count Resident Evil 7 as the first first person Resident Evil, then most of 7 was spent in the Baker household and the tight quarters, the being stalked by various members of the family, and that sense of kind of claustrophobia, I think made 7 a terrifying game. Yeah, going back to 7, I think my initial review of it was, eh, it's okay. And I think the problem with that is because I like rent, I had like $4 in my account and I was like, I could red box this and play it in like a night and I'll still have $3 or something like that. <laughs> I was broke at the time, but uh, I blasted through it. And, you know, when you're blasting through a game and I, I'll always advocate for this, never do that because you don't get to enjoy that. You don't get to enjoy the subtleties. You don't get to like suck it in uh but i went back to it and literally madhouse on that game is probably my favorite resident evil difficulty in all of them like really? i yeah like i i played hardcore on re2 and 3 remake and then uh re1 of course i platinum the that remake and all of them but i gotta say madhouse and re7 was just so much fun and uh I think it's because I, I learned it so much. I was so, like, uh, in depth with it. And, uh, you know, just just overall, like, I was a goddamn god at that game for a second. That uh, when I got to finally, like, built up the balls to get to Madhouse, because you kind of got to do that to, like, play a harder difficulty. I, I loved it. I loved every piece of it. And the weird part is about Resident Evil 7, which RE8 doesn't have, in my opinion, is that... When even when you're in a part where you know the the game, you know the layout, you know where everyone is, you know Jack's not around at that certain segment, whatever. There's still like this weird sense of dread. <laughs> yes, there is. Just, yeah, just being where wherever it is you are that you know that's safe. There's still a sense of dread because you know, like around the corner or something, there's a thing that is going to challenge you. And I feel like Resident Evil Eight. I don't want to say doesn't specifically it does do that but not for the factor of scares it does it more for well we'll get into it but yeah i would say i would say seven builds up the horror more in my opinion it does eight is more action focused by all means you are going to get more guns more bullets and more enemies for example when you've played classic resident evil more than i have and in those old RE games, the idea is to save ammunition and avoid encounters if you can. If there's a zombie that you can maneuver around because it's no threat, you don't kill the zombie. You just move around it, right? Right. And in 7, the, the main enemies were the, the lumbering molds. There were some faster molded characters, but in general, there were these big hulk hulking molds that could do a lot of damage to you. But they were also slow and their moves were telegraphed, so if you wanted to maneuver around them, you easily could. When you were playing through it, did you try to do that, or did you just go more for the kill every time? I want to say there's, like, certain segments where it's like, okay, I can... Tri well, and this this goes back to the factor of mastering the game. There's certain molded where you can walk into a room, they'll pop out of the wall. But you know if you just walk back three steps, and this is even an RE2 remake. If you walk back three steps through the door, they'll just sink into the floor... You re-enter the room and you can just freely walk around. There you go. And uh, despawn them. So, I mean, you know, a little bit of both. And in 8, though, you get a lot of enemies coming at, or I say 8, but in Village, 
you get a lot of enemies, specifically the ones that you see mostly in the gameplay footage and trailers, the lichens. You get a lot of them. Like, there are scenes where they will just come at you in a drove, like in waves, like eight at a time. Yeah. Man, you know, I don't know what to say about that, because it still didn't feel like I was being swarmed. I don't know about you, Webb. I felt like at times there was a swarm of them, because I, I felt like there'd be points of like, Jesus, how many are there? And it would, it happened on a couple occasions, I don't want to say which ones. And not saying it's a bad feeling, but it just didn't feel like a very Resident Evil feeling as opposed to more of an action game in a way, I guess. Like, similar to RE4, I would say, more than anything. Still Resident Evil, but, you know, it's a perfect example. One of the first sequences of the game, and this is not really a spoiler for the most part, but there's a sequence near the start of the game that plays out very much like the village scene from Resident Evil 4, that first village scene where you have to hide in a in the houses, barricade them up, all that stuff. Yeah. And you get the sense there that the enemies are, are going to be more of a prevalent threat than the zombies would have been in a different RE game. Yeah, I could I could see that. Um, I think it's like, you know, the uh, villagers were such a threat, but they were still human, you know, mind-controlled parasites by Las Plagas. And in this one, it's like they're just wild animals. They're werewolves, basically. Uh, which the story does, you know, it's best at trying to explain the B.O.W. part of that. But, uh, yeah, it's basically that. It's just I think they're a little bit more wild. Um, in my opinion, you could still handle them the same way, though, right? I guess for the most part. I, I, I noticed that the closing distance and their ability to get you from an angle is a bit better. Yeah, I would say that. And this might be this, you know, like, again, I haven't played on the hardest difficulty. I'm sure it's just a fucking extreme. But uh, again, the swarming mechanism of it, I felt more uh, swarmed by the villagers with the Las Plagas than I did the werewolves. And I've played uh, so far. I've only played on normal, I should say. Now, there is a mechanic that is added to this last two games, seven and, and village of the block. And effectively knowing how and when to block enemy attacks is a huge factor in being able to get through these games a lot easier. Uh, but it's still a relatively new mechanic to the series, but it really does change how you play tremendously if you're trying to be more careful and not have to use all your items and healing supplies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd be like, oh yeah, I could block. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 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 normally it would normally come up in certain occasions where it's like, gosh, I'm taking off a lot of damage. Oh crap, I, I can block these things. That would help. Yeah, that would help out a lot. Damn it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, but once you do use it, you realize, wow, that really does minimize damage. Yeah, it really does, especially uh, especially with uh, Lady Demes later. But yeah, I think I think when it comes to blocking mechanism, uh, even in RE seven. It was either live or die by using that on the harder difficulties. So I'm kind of curious about that. But um, mechanism-wise, I think it's very helpful. And if if you're playing like an RE game for the first time, don't forget to block. Yes. <laughs> and for the for the most part, under technical achievements, I mean, the game plays well. Uh, the play control is fine. If you've played any kind of a first-person shooter, this handles well. You still have a, uh, a classic Resident Evil quick turn. Uh, by hitting back in circle or uh, back in uh, B if you're playing on an Xbox. So being able to do that gives you that freedom of movement. But uh, I think you and I both played this on a standard PS4, right? Yes. And the game looks great. I mean, I can imagine it look even better on a PS5. But even on a PS4, it looks damn good. Oh, just amazing. Um, one of the things that... Um... I want to point out, though, and this isn't Webb's fault or anything, and in fact, it's no one's fault, except for maybe Capcom's. Maybe not even then, because it's a base PS4, but are you, actually, are you playing on a base PS4, too? I No, I'm playing on a base PS4. Yeah, PS4, right? No, you said a PS4, too, and I don't know what a PS4, <laughs> 2 is. I mean, that sounds like a hybrid of, uh, you know, you put a PS4 on top of a PS2, and I don't know why you're doing it. I'm not judging you. I'm well, not trying to judge you. I don't know what kind of mysterious experiments you're doing. Heisenberg, you can do whatever you want. But 
I play on a standard PS4, base PS4. Yes. So at the base PS4, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't resist, could you? <laughs> Yeah. There, there are times where I don't know which one of us is the bigger asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I think we get a little knocks in, but <laughs> um, you, if you're like speed running this game and you're going through it super fast, which I've already been doing, I'm on my three hour run for the trophy. Uh, if you transition it, like, okay, first off, the game quickly hides uh, load times between elevators. There's these elevators that are really long. Oh my god, I, they're like Mass Effect levels of elevators. Jesus yeah. Christmas. And it is hiding load times. Well, they couldn't hide the fact that if you're like, let's say, in a castle and you're running through every room as fast as you can on a base PS4, there will be moments where you enter a room like going out to the courtyard and the screen will go black for a second. You'll see the loading thing really? and then all of a sudden it'll come back up. Yep. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, so it does have a little bit of a quick performance issue in that factor, but I, I really don't think it's a detriment. It didn't bother me. But when you're in a hurry, it's kind of like, ah, hurry up. Okay, all right, here we go again. You're right, though, that aside from the elevators, uh, the game does a very good job of of masking loading times in terms of, when I think of it, I really don't think of a lot of loading times. Yeah, it felt uh, more... Uh, how would you say it? Um, streamlined. It really did. And apparently, I, like, I've read reports that there are people who are being able to play this on PCs without, uh, like, specialized integrated graphics cards. Yeah. Uh, my base PSC, PC, well, it's a laptop, I should say, but it's it's got a pretty good graphics card. It can run RE2 Remake, but even RE8 ran fine. And it's not even that great of a PC, so I was pretty surprised. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact and I got to give credit here, Capcom's RE engine that they've created, which they say it's the Reach for the Moon engine, but and it's got a moon in the logo, but let's face it, the RE stands for Resident Evil. It was created for RE7. You put RE there for a reason. Don't don't try to mess with me. Don't mess we, with me, Capcom. We do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a great engine. It's robust, and they use it for a lot of things. They, they've used the same engine that they use for 7 and Village. For the Capcom Arcade Collection and Ghost and Goblins Resurrection. Oh, really? Yes. The, wow. the 2D games, they've used the same engine for them that they've used for, for Resident Evil Village. This thing is versatile as all hell, and apparently they've got it specialized to be able to just work fine with these older gen systems, even though like Village was hopefully being designed for, for PS5 and Xbox Series X. Wow, that's that's pretty rad. It is, and the the fruits of their efforts pay off because the enemies look great and vibrant. The the heads explode with wonderful ferocity. Uh, the characters all look wonderfully detailed. Uh, it's it's really a, a graphical powerhouse that you know you, it's it's impressive to look at still and to appreciate everything that you see unfolding before you. And because it's not as dank and dark as Resident Evil Seven was, since you were mostly playing at night in the Baker House. Uh, you get to see things in more, more vibrancy. There's less opportunity to hide things. And and people I've talked to, you know, close friends, even Web, they all say, you know, oh well, I still prefer RE7 or whatever the argument is. Uh, this where this worked better in RE7. One thing they cannot contest is the fact that RE8 plays way more fluidly in the RE engine than RE7 did, and it feels so much better. It really does. It feels just a lot better. Because they've been able to refine things. And you you can argue that the, the slower pacing, I guess, of RE7 added to the threatening atmosphere. But things don't feel as fun and organically threatening when you're fighting the game so much as you are fighting the enemies in the game, if that makes sense. Yeah. Even with the uh, running shoes in RE7, it, it like you're moving faster, but it still doesn't feel, I don't know, just systematically as fluid as you do in RE8 just running. It's it's weird because you're playing the same character kind of like in the same, you know, first person view. And you're like, wow, this just feels better. So I, I think they tweaked it a little bit is what I'm saying. I would agree. And then on top of all that, when it comes to the actual gameplay, it's... Yeah, uh, we've, we've touched on it, and we'll, we'll finish up talking about the mechanics by saying this. 
you will definitely have a more action-based experience with this than you will a survival horror one, even though there are elements of survival horror in there. And I guess the one that can be talked about the most without doing spoilers, because it was so prevalent in the marketing, by accident was so prevalent in the marketing, is uh, Lady Dimisque. Dimisque. It's French. I, I say Dim Dimitrescu or Dimitrescu. Dim Dimesc Dimesc Dimitrescu. Dimitrescu, I think it is. Dimitrescu, yeah. Dimitrescu. Uh, but yeah, she's, hey, she's she's Lady D. She is a, uh, she she's a lot of woman. Oh yeah, I uh, I sadly didn't get frightened by her. <laughs> <laughs> no, most most people apparently did not. Um, yeah. The only way that she's really threatening at this point in time is if you're trying to do a speed run and she's getting in your way, or if you're trying to do the limited healing run and you're taking damage. Right. Uh, great character design, though, and uh, I think we should. I think we should transition a little bit into the story here, Wub, because uh, I agree. We got so much to cover. We do. Uh, so let's just we'll summarize right off the bat. We're going to get into spoiler territory. So if you before we do that, let's just say this flat out when it comes to the game. Do you recommend Resident Evil Village be played by people, and to what? Resident Evil fans should play it or what ones would would have an issue with this I guess I think every Resident Evil fan would agree that this is a step in the middle ground of the right direction when I say middle ground because it does both the horror and the action mostly action a little bit more it's like 60 40 but it does a little bit of both to appease both of the fans, because I know a lot of people will say Resident Evil 4 is their favorite. They couldn't play the other ones for obvious reasons. So I think it's the step in a middling ground direction for RE fans that they can get a taste of both the action and horror the series has brought over the years. Would you rank this above 7 or below 7? I'm still thinking about it. And I still am not sure mm. uh, because I want to say no, but then I'm thinking, mm, I don't know. What about compared to Resident Evil 3's remake? That's tough too. That's just so tough. And the reason being, again, is because Ethan isn't as compelling to me as Jill. And uh, Jill kicks ass. So, um, yeah, it's it's tough. It's so tough. I'm sorry I don't have a definitive answer. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. If you could play Jill in both games, which game would you rather be playing as Jill? Probably still three, then. Interesting, in that interesting. Case. Only because that's kind of always been her story, and I've lived with it for too long. It's hard to separate it. Well, I'll go out and say I like this a lot better than three, because I think I feel like three felt like an incomplete game. I think that they skimped on it. They reused certain nemesis bosses or boss forms a bit too much. And I feel like there was just more game that should have been in 3. And it just kind of got trimmed out. Uh, it felt like an incomplete experience to me. And we had we talked a little bit about that and how it could have been a bit better in terms of like making the gameplay a bit longer and not removing things from the original Resident Evil 3. Mm -hmm. This feels like a complete experience as a whole. Like start to finish... I feel like you get your money's worth out of this game. And the replays, this won't spoil anything, but the replays of New Game Plus with the end content store that they took from 3, which I think was one of the best things they did, they took a lot of what they did for the end game of Resident Evil 3 and put it into this so that you can buy upgrades and mechanics that you can then use for your next playthrough, even on a harder difficulty mode, which is awesome. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but in terms of comparing it to 7... I, I can't put one above the other. I'd say seven scarier, and it's good for that. Village is more action packed, and it's good for that. And in in for me on a given day, I'll take the action over the horror because I don't like being scared. I'm a sissy. That's fine. Uh, you know what? I'll put it this way, and this uh, Resident Evil fans may actually get this more. So I grew up uh, with RE one and RE two at the same time, and not because I like bought them when they released. I actually bought them around like literally same time. Uh, so I wasn't there like the first year that RE came out. I read it in the magazines and everything. But to me, 
it's hard to separate which one of them is better, RE1 or RE2. To me, they're just so perfect in everything they do that RE7 and RE8 have that same feeling. They're so perfect in everything they're doing that they're a part of their own, you know, one, two storyline, just like one and two are. So it's kind of like that. Like if someone was like, what's your top RE game? I always say the same thing. It's either a toss up between RE1 and RE2. That's just the way it is. I can't decide. Well, let's talk about the story then and start going through this game scene by scene. And we can easily get through the first part where it's just, you're in the house, you're Ethan, you're talking with Mia, your wife, you have to tuck Rose, your daughter, into bed. And then you go down the stairs, spend more time with Mia, you guys are in a European city because you've been moved out after all the things that happened in the previous game. And uh, Chris from you know, the BSAA, uh, Chris Redfield that is, has been looking after you guys and relocating you, almost like witness protection. And then... Uh, things don't go well that night as uh, as you're just standing there in the kitchen, Mia gets shot. Like, a sniper rifle round just hits her in the shoulder, and she gets gunned down. And Ethan's like, what the hell? Someone's killing my wife! And <laughs> not actually what he says. That would be an under <laughs> understatement. And then you see, like, Chris barge in, Chris Redfield, gunning down Mia and, like, shooting her with an assault rifle. And next thing you know, Ethan's unconscious. There he's being dragged out of the house, and uh, when you regain consciousness, there was a car that you were in that's now tipped over and, and trashed, and Rose was kidnapped with you. You have no idea where Rose is, and you have to kind of stumble around to find out what the hell happened. Right, and like little subtle things that they try to do in the house right before, you know, Mia gets silenced, you should say, and also Mia in quotes, but... uh one of the things that you do learn while in the house, and I'm glad that they kind of did this and people don't like the callbacks. I've read a couple online, but they do mention a couple things that Ethan and Mia have been trained now by the BSAA uh, for to be like survivalists and, you know, a little combat ready. OK, fine. I get that. That makes sense. Another thing, the Baker family residence. It's been three years since that incident, mm -hmm. and there's a file there that says that the BSAA, blah, 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 there's this news report that something happened that contaminated the area, and it's going to be another 10 years till it's inhabitable, or habitable, and right now nobody can go around that area. Yeah, good swamp cover gas. Up. Swamp yeah, gas. Yeah, very good cover-up. <laughs> though, though, you know, there there is some honest truth to stuff like that, where uh, perhaps you've heard of things that happen, like there's green algae that can uh, appear in in beaches. And, like, it's yeah. this, just toxic algae that releases gas that will fucking kill you if you breathe it in. So yeah. stuff like that does happen, surprisingly. So for something to happen like in a swamp like that is not far enough removed from reality to where, yeah, stuff like that could have occurred, but obviously they're just using this as a cover-up for, uh, for the mold. Yeah, I took it as very, like, uh, Stephen King algae that grows on you that's toxic BSAA nonsense. But it's totally fine. It totally works for the story. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's great. So there's that. There's, like, uh, there's a Joseph Kendo book there that says something about combat or guns yep. or whatever. Notice that. that callback. Cool. Yeah, callback to Raccoon. Uh, wow, it's like he's an author? All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway... Small town author. We'll see what to say here. Put your yeah. arms in front of your face to block an attack. It works every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just in this way, very fast. I could just see Ethan in his room, just uh, practicing. Uh, yeah, just. What do you think, Mia? Yeah, that's fine, Ethan. Uh, can we go to bed? Hold <laughs> on, one more. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's these little things, but yeah, basically, like you said, Webb, the story unravels very quickly. It's just a quick setup. And uh, I don't know about you, but that uh, <laughs> transition from the dark woods to the sun's up and now you see a castle. Very weird. Yeah, things got from dark to light very fast. Like I was in the house for all 30 seconds. And I was like, oh, it's light outside. That's nice. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was that was a bit much. Yeah, but you quickly get to the village and um, things are awry. Uh, yes. They're so awry, they may not even be a pumpernickel. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a rye bread joke. 
<laughs> Anywho, <laughs> you're you're making the connections here, yeah. <laughs> which is another thing I forgot to mention. People are like, I like Mia, and it's like, don't forget she was part of the connections, which was I think funded by Albert Wesker's group, which was who helped create the mold it, which was evil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's Mia, an evil person. Mia was is not a, an incredibly good, good-hearted person. Uh, she's kind of reformed, I guess you could say, but she was involved in some dark shit, and people probably died. Yeah, and she was basically babysitting something that could mind control people. Hence, RE seven. Anyway, <laughs> yes. Anyway, as Ethan's traveling through this village that he finds, he it doesn't take long for him to find a survivor who's like, ah, oh, shit, the lichens are coming, they're coming, and he gets Ethan a handgun. And you just try to start shooting down some of these some of these werewolf like monsters, uh, but it's not long before Ethan has part of his left hand literally eaten off. Yeah, this is going to be a a thing that continues on through the whole game. Yes, it will be. He, the good old Ethan. Ethan. <laughs> it's explained though, and uh, I like. I like how it's explained, kind of. I don't know. I don't want to fight against it. But we'll, we'll, get to weird, we'll get yeah. to that. We'll get to that. But not long after you're eaten partially, I uh, got part of your hand uh, bitten off, you, you start to make your, your trek through the town, and uh, you're, you're directed towards just kind of exploring a little, a few of these houses. You meet an old hag lady who's uh, kind of like the, the lady from Silent Hill. Uh, in Silent Hill 2. Mm-hmm. So you meet her, and she's all cackling and crazy. And it's like, ah, death is coming here! Ha 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 ha! And yeah. it's like, okay, well, you know, you do you, and I'll just, you know, fight off werewolves. Don't know what you're still like. <laughs> the bell tolls for us all. They're coming! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are. I got a gun. What do you got? I got a stick with skulls on it! Okay. See how that is? We should... Yeah, we should say Mia in quotes and old lady in quotes. In quotes. Yeah. And then as you continue along, you shoot some zombies, you get some uh, uh, some crests that you're going to have to collect. And uh, essentially, you eventually work your way to finding a couple other survivors, uh, a young woman and her ailing father. And you're trying to help get them to, I think it's uh, Liza's house? Mm-hmm. And because apparently Liza is somebody who's kind of the the town, I don't want to say mentor, but she's the the town mum, so to say, the the people that mm-hmm. the person that people turn to when they're in need. So you try to get to she's, her house. Yeah, she she's like the good Christian. Yeah, good Christian, the good Samaritan. Yeah, <laughs> for a Christian, she certainly has some very odd prayers she's going to be reciting. I should say the good. Uh, I don't even know how to put it in a nice way. Basically, the good Christian lady of the, the hill. The good cult yeah. follower. There you go. <laughs> yeah, the good cultist. Which, incidentally, I believe that's my favorite soap opera, the good cultist. Uh, I, I, I'm on season four. It's the best. <laughs> I'm glad that they continued. <laughs> it, it lost a little bit when they made the move from ABC to Hulu, but it's still pretty good. <laughs> the Rick and Morty crossover was the best for me. I didn't even see that one coming. I mean... <laughs> Turning them live action for a while and then switching back to animation and then to puppets of all things? Who would have thought cults and animation? <laughs> oh, obviously it turned out well. It turned out a lot better for the people in Liza's village. Uh, they, uh, they, you, you, you go in and you eventually lead everybody or lead her there and they don't like you. Which just doesn't matter because they're going to be dead in a little bit anyway. Uh, so... <laughs> there's some arguing, some fighting, and some prayer, and like, oh, the dark god, take us into thee, wrap thee in thy wings of vengeance. Like, some really not a happy prayer. Like, if you thought the Westboro Baptist Church was bad for their hating of gays, this this church probably just wants you, everyone dead. Like, all of you. Yeah, it's very uh, regional. Like, nobody has any sort of sense of culture outside of their own. And um, the big thing, the big weird thing... Uh, that as far as I can remember is never really explained is that they all believe in mother, this person named mother Miranda who has taken care of them and protected them, blah, blah, blah. And uh, as we learn and as we see after things go (laughs) not very good, uh, one of the old men who you helped get into the uh, room there, 
basically gets some little werewolf in him. He goes a little old man wolf and kills everyone. And then you have to kind of break out. But as you leave, Mother Miranda kills the guy with the shotgun out in the field. So it doesn't really make any sense. And that and Chris shooting Mia, it's just it's just building up all these questions. Old man, look at my wolf. He's a lot like you are. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, I have to note Mother Miranda, my favorite Michael Jackson song of all time. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mother Miranda, no. <laughs> Mother Molded. Miranda. I like the uh, Neil Young song, Molded in the Damage Done. Or what was it? That's <laughs> yeah, so funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> down by the river, I shot a werewolf. <laughs> Uh, Christ Almighty! As yeah, you're mentioning, like everything that's happening there, and, and all the weird stuff that goes down, and in, in the the midst of what's happening with uh, the the father turning into the werewolf and everything, everyone dies. Just everyone dies. Uh, they all get consumed yeah. by fire or eaten by a werewolf. Everyone's dead except for Ethan, who even himself is like, "Why does everyone I meet die?" Yeah, that little character moment. I hate to say, kind of falls flat for me. Uh, another thing that fell flat, too, was that, okay, there's a village. There's people still alive. I kind of wish we got to see more people. Yeah. But that's, that's it. That Everyone you meet, fucking dead right there. That's yep. it. Everyone's dead. It would have been nice to have some people there as kind of like, you know, a want to want to try to protect this village a little bit more. But not going to happen. Oh. Well, yeah, and it even would have gone back to old RE tropes of running in the survivors, you know? Uh, that would have been great. So, I, th I think they missed... It was a missed opportunity on that end. It was. But, as you continue along now, you, you basically realize that you have to find Rose. And the, the only lead is essentially going to a castle. Uh, there's a castle there. You've been directed to go there, and on your way you meet the Duke. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, I forget what he says. He's like, hello, Ethan Winters. Uh, let's see if you are what you're made of. Uh, and then I think you're actually introduced to the whole family. Yes, you're and... introduced to the whole family like right around that time, too, like right afterwards. Yeah, because he kind of kidnaps you, and um, <laughs> you get to meet... NJ. NJ. Yeah, I made that NJ. same joke when I was playing the game. <laughs> I remember watching it. Yes, you were and... watching me live stream it when I made the Angie joke. Yeah, which, by the way, Webb does have his critical Android live stream videos of that. And uh, it, before he even said it, I was thinking of that. And then as soon as he said it, I started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well. I, I know. I was like, NJ. Singing NJ. with you. Is that a scissor in your eye? <laughs> uh, for anyone who's too young, that's a Rolling Stone song. But anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. I feel uh, old now. <laughs> that's one of the, the best moments of the, of the, the game, too. Uh, it's, it's like the Baker household dinner in, in a different way, where mm -hmm. you're meeting the four lords and Mother Miranda. And the four lords are uh, Lady Dimitrescu, um, the uh, I can't remember her name. It, it's like Donna or something. I think. Yeah, Donna Beneviento. Yeah, Beneviento. Very Italian, Beneviento. Yep. You see my doll. We should mention this does take place in Romania, but yeah, I, yeah. And you also get to meet uh, Moreau, who kind of looks like uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame if he. Uh, Kind of mated with one of the fish people from uh, from the Innsmouth, <laughs> from, <laughs> from Lovecraft's Innsmouth. And, wow, what a callback! <laughs> yeah. and, and then on top of all that, you have who can best be described. His name is Heisenberg, but he's basically homeless vagrant Magneto played by Nick Cage. There you go. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> like picture a homeless vagrant. Now picture that he has the powers of Magneto, and now picture him being voiced by Nick Cage, and <laughs> you have Heisenberg. Ethan, I love you. <laughs> Basically, yes. 
And yeah. we, we did we do get to find out some of the family drama that plays out here because Mother Miranda has to pick somebody to dispose of Ethan. And everybody wants to kill him in their own way. Uh, but Heisenberg gets to take uh, take the point on this one. Which is very weird because it kind of plays up to this factor that later on you learn Heisenberg is kind of like a... He wants to be... He's like... He feels like he's the second in command. And you know how those stories go where the second command wants to be the alpha male. And he kind of wants to take over and, you know, be the leader and take down Mother Miranda. So I think this point uh, of her handing over Ethan to him to let... You know, Ethan go on this little run and skirmish. It's very uh, American Gladiator. Is um, because she's trying to give him something to kind of, I don't know, what would you say, Webb? Hold him off? Appease like, him. You know, I'm being, yeah, appease him. I'm being so nice to you. Here you go. You can have him. And Lady Demistress, uh, Demistress, I can't even, it doesn't matter. Demistress. Uh, we're not French. No, we're not. <laughs> yeah, Demistress, you. Uh, but uh, she cannot stand it which makes total sense because she's a woman of stature literally and she feels like ethan's mine obviously right. so there's this little bit of uh you know arguing between the family and as we learn the family isn't specifically quote-unquote family they're just uh creations of mother miranda yeah and it's it's interesting to see that byplay between them because they do not get along very well uh, they all have their own kind of feelings and emotions about each other. And a, a lot of that is just born of the fact that they were brought together against their will by Mother Miranda and her experiments. And now they're kind of just stuck as her puppets in a way. And it, it's – Heisenberg has the, the largest problem with this. But they all have their own kind of range of frustration with it. And you get the sense, I, I guess if you look back at it in hindsight – that Heisenberg kind of wanted to toy with you in this way because he didn't want to kill you. At least not yet. Right. Uh, it's very, again, he's like a scar to Mother Miranda Mufasa. Uh, but Ethan kind of, he kind of sees Ethan as his way out. Yes. And so Ethan manages to escape despite the fact that he's shackled. He's given a 10-second head start to run. He starts running. Uh, he manages to break his shackles after running through these, these, these hallways and cave caverns of werewolves. And shackles get shorn off uh, by this big spike trap. And eventually, he's able to get back to Castle Dimitrescu, where he was trying to get to before he got kidnapped. And now is where the game proper kind of begins, in a sense. Right. And I don't want to say, like, I, I kind of feel like the Baker residence in RE7 was my favorite part of that game. Be only because it called so much back to the original Resident Evil. And now we have that same point of contention where, like, in RE7, the Baker residence kind of felt short-lived. And here we are in the castle, which doesn't last that long. But while we are there... It's freaking magnificent. I don't know about you, Webb, but I absolutely adored it. I I think I've had partially my taste for Castles in Resident Evil ruined by RE4. Because uh, I think one of the biggest complaints about that game, if you were to ask anybody who really analyzes it, is that of all the areas that you spend time in, you spend way too much time in that castle. I could see that. I think RE4, like the area is blur to me. Uh, just because there's so much just, I mean, it's literally, you're just going into a room and doing the same exact thing over and over again. They're just setting up different, you know, ways to do it. And uh, I don't know, it just feels different slightly because this is more of a, you get to wander, but you, you're aware that you might be chased at some point. And I, I should mention, because this is the reason most people didn't want to play RE2 Remake, RE3 Remake and even this, or RE7, is because they don't like the fact that there might be a villain that feels invincible, uh, that you can't, you know, you have no power over, you have to completely run from. It's not like that at all in this game. Absolutely not. Right. Fortunately, uh, Lady Dimitrescu, as uh, foreboding as she is, 
does not play a very large role in terms of the game proper or in terms of being a chasing factor for you throughout the castle. She is there. She does, excuse me, she does pose a bit of a threat, but not one that can be man or that can't be managed. Like it's pretty easily manageable dealing with her and getting around the the, the threat that she poses because it's really not that that big a threat at all. Yeah, like, I mean, think of it this way. If, like, you were uh, in your living room, and there's your couch, and there's, like, a a median in between it, as long as you keep running around the median, uh, you're fine. Like, she's never going to catch up to you, even on normal difficulty. In fact, she might lose speed and muster. So, you're perfectly fine. It's not really difficult. No, what's actually more of a threat is her three daughters that you have to fight. Because when they do come up, it can be intimidating because you'll be swarmed by bugs. And if you stay along, if you stay in the bug swarm too long, you start getting damaged gradually. Mm-hmm. And so you have to run to a place. And we find out that the these these creatures that are made up of her daughters are, are made up of like living bugs that just have like a hive mind that kind of have a consciousness that form together to be vaguely human at times. And... The only thing that weakens them so that you can kill them is exposure to the cold. Right. It was kind of a nice little thing, actually. Uh, It made total sense. I mean, Lady Dimitrescu, for some reason, isn't affected by it because she's like the alpha of the group. But her daughters are apparently uh, susceptible to cold. And it does explain, I believe, in a file somewhere that um, there's a reason for that. And it's basically that the toxin that they're filled with, the BOW toxin, the experiment, you know, and these things are factors in real life, heat and cold in uh, vaccines or anything. Uh, So it does play an important role and it makes a lot of sense. I think (laughs) given the setting, it's not played up too harshly because it feels like universal monsters in a way. Right. But uh, I appreciate the fact that they took time to do that at all because they didn't have to. So. And essentially, you go around Castle Dimitrescu, you solve a few puzzles, shoot a few flying monsters, and ultimately, after uh, some some mild cut scenes and some wading through uh, the blood pool underneath the castle where her blood uh, blood tub is drained into, which is freaky for the monsters that pop up under the blood. That that's a little that was a nice touch. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I gotta ask you this, Web. Like, when you were in certain segments uh, that you found out later, like, oh, she didn't chase me at all, that whole part of the game was safe, did you always feel a sense of dread, though, that she was going to come after you? Or were you sometimes like, oh, I don't think she'll chase me in the segment? I felt like... Because I watched you play this, so I kind of know, but I didn't actually know. Like, there were times where I, I was more cognizant that she would appear based off of what I was picking up from her AI pattern. There were certain areas that she seemed, that she seemed to be stalking more than others. Mm-hmm. So, what they did here that was better than some of the other game, uh, like Resident Evil 2, for example, is that Mr. X could be a pre- uh, like a terrible presence when you were trying to solve certain puzzles. And that could be annoying. Not so much the case here with Lady D. I... I was more concerned about, um, I guess that that blood pool area where just things were coming up out of the blood suddenly. That was creepier to me than her stalking me. I didn't feel the same sense of dread that I felt with Mister X. Yeah, I remember going you uh, watching you going through that portion. You did seem a little on edge. Uh, for me, uh, sadly, the wheels turning in my head because I just mastered RE seven so harshly. I mean, like, I could not... I I died maybe once on accident on Madhouse. That was it. Mm. I I saw the same team building those same concepts uh, of the vertical slice and everything. Uh, You know, it's a development term, but basically uh, building the land proper and how characters could interact within it like this part i knew was instantly safe that's why i asked you right i could see the wheels turning and i was like okay i'm fine here okay i'm fine here and i just kept going and going and then eventually i didn't feel any dread at all from any of them because it i could just see the concepts of re7 in place here so well that i was like wow 
you know, it's it's all just as I imagined, and it played out exactly the same way. Yeah, I it was it was fun wandering around the house at times. Uh, I do like the treasure hunting element, though. The one thing I will point out, I mentioned this in my written review, and I'll mention it here. This is something that Resident Evil 3 did a lot better. Sometimes trying to spot items in this very detailed map that they've given you, a detailed world, is atrociously difficult. It is sometimes maddening to look on your map and see it colored red knowing that you have an item to pick up and not be able to find the fucking item. In, yeah. in RE3, if you got close to an item, even without like fully picking it up, they put it on your map. So like you could see the icon of the item on your map. That was much more helpful than the kind of bullshit hide-and-seek that I'm playing trying to find items in this place, where it's just so hard to find them because they... It's such a detailed environment, and th these things are not easy to find. At least in other games, they're fucking glowing. <laughs> so that yeah. that's the only thing that really frustrated me about some of the treasure hunting. But I will say, I love the labyrinth puzzles that you have to do if you want to get, like, the uh, all the treasures. Mm -hmm. Those are fun. Well, I don't disagree with you with that. And I did, I think I popped in the chat for, like, the uh, treasure over one of the portraits in the main hall. Yes, you did. Yeah. If I'm remembering, yeah. So that I don't think people would have noticed unless they took the time. But then they're like, "Hey, where's Lady D?" And so mm -hmm. they can't they can't really do that. But uh, I get the frustration. I, it's hard for me because I think like, well, you know, how many games today actually go out and they're trying to, uh, you know, cater to those people that really want hard secrets to find, and you know, they don't want it to be spoon fed to them. I think a lot of uh, gamers do, uh, you know, want those type of secrets in their games. So it's it's a hard balance. But I think for, for the most part, it was mostly treasure you didn't even really need. So that's my opinion. So then moving along from, from there, so we've covered a lot of the castle. We have basically the climactic fight between you and Lady Dimitrescu when... Uh, you, you find a knife and just go to town on her. Yeah, how did you feel about that fight? Because I thought it was... I mean, we all kind of saw it coming. <laughs> Everyone's like, she's so hot. And it's like, no, she's not. Just yeah, there's something, there's something hiding there. I did not yeah. think Flying Dragon. I didn't think that either. <laughs> uh, I will say, I wasn't... I kind of prefer the kind of, like, Titan... Like, or not Titan, Tyrant kind of fight, which she easily could have been a Tyrant kind of fight. Uh, I think there's something uh, more threatening about that than, like, Big Dragon. Sometimes I like the more mundane threat than I do, like, the epic, like, giant set piece. I would have welcomed that more. I think even Heisenberg mentioned something like that. He's like, one day you'll grow into how big your ego is, or something like that. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. Yeah. But yeah, uh, but that would have yeah. been a bit better than, you know, flying dragon fight. Yeah, it was a little weird. But I guess it was a castle. I don't know. I, uh, at the, eh. Yeah. Uh, but there is something cool that at the end of the day, when you get out of the castle and you start to uh, traverse back to where the merchant is, who we forgot to mention, uh, the merchant that is basically like the brother to RE4's merchant. Again, I don't know why Capcom... Is remaking RE4. They already did, kind of. Yeah, and, and that's basically you know, what I was going to say earlier before we got into spoilers. This game is a, a, almost a remake of RE4 in many ways. It very much is. But, full, um, full spoiler territory is we're going to talk about things that are going to happen. Similarities. Village with an attack and an assault. Uh, a broken down European village at that. Treasures that you can hunt and sell to a merchant. A merchant that can sell and upgrade guns to you. And it keeps popping up in random places. Uh, a giant fish monster that can eat you, exploring places on a riverboat, going down into the caverns where there's people mining stuff out of the caverns. Like, there's a lot of similarities uh, that are going to happen between RE4 and RE8, and it's kind of a little much at times. Yeah. Guns. <laughs> Lots of guns. I just wanted to add something. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> Yeah, so you, you meet the merchant, and he explains to you after you get this flask from Lady D. He says, go ahead and look at it. And you realize that it's parts of Rose, your daughter, 
and you kind of freak out and you're like, what do you mean? It's parts of her. She's supposed to be it's still alive, right? What the hell? Oh, wait, Rose is the daughter, Rose? Yeah. I thought it was parts of Rose, the old lady from Titanic. Oh, God. Wow, that, wow I, your interpretation of the game is a lot different than mine. That was my first impression. But, wow. you know, I, I, I wikied it. I looked deeper. This makes a bit more sense as a baby because I was thinking, how they get that old woman in that <laughs> like <answer> sentence? <laughs> I was like, why is Ethan sketching naked people? <laughs> why did they fit, how they fit that old woman, the little flask? <laughs> that explains why when I was trying to kill Angie, she said, "Draw me like one of your French girls." <laughs> you mean Angie? Angie. Angie. Anyway, yeah. yes. Uh we get those flasks, you find out, like you said, that Rose has been <laughs> segmented and put into the flasks. <laughs> you have to say it like the old lady. Rose! Rose! <laughs> yeah. So, it's a revelation for Ethan. And um, even for like playing the game, I was like, what? This is so bizarre. But you can kind of find out things later, which we'll get to. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things about this game that I found uh, uh, adds replay value is that you return to the village a uh, many a times. Mm -hmm. And every time you return, there's something new to find out. Yes. And this is one of the few compl uh, few other complaints I have is that navigating through the village can be a bit of a hassle because there's organic objects that might be in the way, like tree branches or doors that are busted so you can't get through the gates. And it makes traversing the village a bit of a headache because the map doesn't really help you as much as you'd like it to, I guess. So sometimes you're going to have to wander down like these side paths in the village to get to where you need to go. And you can't just, the straight line is not going to cut it. You're going to have to wander all over the fucking place for some of this stuff. Yeah, that might be the only detriment to it is that it's like, oh, I need to get to the other side of these two buildings. How the fuck do I do that? And then you find out, oh, I got to jump through a window. Oh, wait, really? now I have to, like, remember to jump through that window every time I want to get through this side? Yeah, it's uh -huh. a mess. Yeah. It's a bit much. And, and trying to find and get back to some of those places where you have to use, like, the wheel crank for the well or a certain key, it can be a hell of a time trying to find your way back. Yeah, it's like this really jarring navigation that you have to remember. Uh, it wasn't so bad for me because I have a pretty good memory uh, game wise, like when I play through something, I'm like, oh, I remember this. But I could, I could see the aggravation from people being like, where do I go again? Because this is ridiculous, which it is. But so. aside, aside from revisiting the village, uh, the next area that we get to, because uh, you have to find the pieces of Rose now, and we find out that the lords, each of the three lords, is guarding the pieces, or each of the three remaining lords. Uh, so then we get to go <laughs> to House Benedetto. Yeah, or Beneviento. Uh, Bene Beneviento, yeah. So, here's the thing. Uh, I was watching Webb play this live, and uh, <laughs> I kept telling him, I was like, let me know when you're going live, man, because I want to see you do House Beneviento. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> there's a, this is probably the scariest, quote-unquote, scariest portion of the game. It's the arguably actual... the best portion of the game at the same time. Yeah, it's the it's the horror uh, stricken part, but uh, what I I don't even almost want to say anything because I I honestly didn't get a grasp of your impressions fully of the remarkable uh, jump scare that kind of doesn't even like you were not aware that this is going to happen at all. It set you up so hard. Well, we should probably put a very big spoiler warning right now because um, mm -hmm. this is the part of the game that people really should experience for themselves. So. This is one of those perfect pace. I mean, this is so well done. Have you ever played Amnesia The Dark Descent? I have. How did you feel about Amnesia? So I should say I didn't finish it, but I did get past the water portion of it. Okay. Um, so I did get there. Uh, I, the reason I didn't finish it is because, for whatever reason, just got latched onto something else. But I want to say that uh, the parts that I was more scared of in Amnesia ended up being the parts I shouldn't have been scared of, and the parts that were scary weren't as scary. So it kind of set more of a mood than actually uh, a horror 
I don't know. It didn't. It didn't still horror in me uh, as much as it probably should have. Not like RE Seven. I'll just go out and say that I felt Amnesia was incredibly overrated. Um, uh, yep. I think part of it was just like when it came to like monster stalking, it just gave me this. Um, it kind of felt like I was just it luck depending on when they were going to generate. So it's just kind of like a, a sense of like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to throw myself at this. I, I don't care. Whatever happens, happens, whatever. I, I just, I wasn't feeling the, the fear quotient. I was feeling it. Yeah. I'm surprised you did it. Actually. That's pretty, it's pretty cool. Cause you're yeah. not a horror, you're not a big horror dude. No, no, but I still played the game to completion, beat it. And then when I was playing this for house Beneviento, it starts off Everything is just, you know, I knew what was going to come from the sense of, like, this is going to be a puzzle-based thing. Because uh, Resident Evil 7 does something very good about that with the birthday party. Or the happy birthday room. With uh, the kind of trap that Lucas has set up. It's a puzzle. It's a, an escape room, basically. And I like the fact that you don't have to worry about combat there. You just have to worry about escaping the trap that's been set through using puzzle solving skills it's a lot of fun but there's an um, element of tension to it here same thing happened here in house beneviento there's a lot of puzzle solving but the more you progress through the puzzle the scarier and more unnerving things continue to get it is so perfectly paced to me it is right on par with pt as one of the perfect gaming moments of just putting on a little bit more tension, a little bit more fear, over and over, just a little bit more, a little bit more. Because uh, the lights start getting darker. You start seeing different things in the hallways of the house. Because uh, you're all you're stuck in this basement area, and there's only a certain number of rooms that you have access to. And it was getting very uneasy, because I didn't know when the puzzle solving was going to stop. Because I knew at some point in time, just from my knowledge of this game, I was going to try to solve puzzles or try to place something somewhere in this hallway and something was going to stop me from being able to do it or going to try to impede my progress. And what made it even worse was when I found cupboards that you could hide in. That's when I realized, shit, yep. something's going to chase me and I'm going to have to hide. I didn't know yeah. what it was going to be, but because House Beneviento is filled with dolls, I figured it'd be some creepy fucking, like, porcelain doll thing, like, from that fucking Are You Afraid of the Dark episode? Oh, in the wow. basement? I did... Yeah. Like, that would have been creepy as all shit, too. Yeah, this this certainly became, like, the quotient for, like, RE7's uh, birthday party or uh, any any portion where you felt like, ah, oh, I, I, like, my weapons aren't going to work here. And this totally, and it doesn't even really explain it in a good way. Uh, sadly, right. but like your weapons get taken away, so you literally do f that feel that helplessness. And uh, I actually was saddened by the fact that you found that closet, and you're like, "Oh, look, I can stand in it and hide." I was like, "No, I didn't want him to know that." <laughs> well, when I found it out, I was like, "Okay, something's gonna be stalking me." I thought it was gonna be a doll. Like at one point in time, there's a figure out in the hallway that was just standing there, and it was not quite a human. It was a human esque figure but with different proportions, like slightly odd proportions and angles. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh God, there's some sort of thing that's going to chase me. I don't want to go out in the hallway. So I just figure, okay, run at it. Just run. Just like, it can't scare me if I'm, <laughs> if I'm just going to run at it and I expect death. And then you in the comment section were like, Ghostbusters, like, get her! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like Ghostbusters race stance. Get her! Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the approach I was taking to it. Uh, ultimately, it turned out not to be anything to be worried about. Until uh, all the lights went out, and then I walked down the hallway, and you start hearing cries of an infant, mm. and that's a problem enough already. And then the giant fetus came around the corner. Yep, the giant fucking fetus. Um, that's <laughs> I was not expecting that. Well, this might be hard to explain, but here's something that... <laughs> <laughs> what, the giant fetus roaming through the hallways is hard to explain? So, when you're trying to evade this fetus <laughs> from eating you, which you actually a... let it eat you... Is that a euphemism, by the way? Yeah, it kind of is, I guess. I spent yeah. the last weekend trying to avoid the fetus, if you know what I mean. <laughs> 
Um, but you actually let it eat you, and I wanted to ask you about that. Did you do that just to get over the fear of it, or? Yes, that, and I want to see what happened. Um, okay. Because I also figured, ta- from a tactical standpoint, too, what happens if I screw up and I make contact with this thing? How much leeway margin of error do I have to work with? Turns out you have no mar- <laughs> margin of error to work <laughs> with. That's a very logical thing. Uh, and we're going to have to talk about this, because there's like a... There's a lot to talk about, actually, about the fetus. It's it's so bizarre. But anyway, before we get there, so there's and this is going to be hard to explain, but you ran from it at first, then you got eaten, then you replayed it again, which you kept saving continuously. Good job. That was smart. And um, so when you ran from it and, and you were getting the fuse, there's this whole thing you have to do where you take the fuse and you, you have to restart the elevator, blah, blah, blah. But when you restart at the elevator and you're waiting for it to come down and you turned around and you saw the fetus turning the corner, you actually can just wait and get into the elevator. But you were like, I think it's going to get me. So you ran back into the, like, the film room and you did a whole nother, like extra chase. And I'd never seen that before. I just waited for the elevator and got in. So when you did that, I was like, wow, this is kind of great, actually. I want to see what happens. Is he going to survive? You you built up the level of tension for me is what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't want to take any chances. I figured, okay, I, I, I don't know if I can wait for the elevator or not. Maybe the game is going to lull me into false sense of security. Yeah, yeah. And I absolutely was – I honestly thought I was going to die when I did it myself. But you, you totally make it every time. <laughs> I said, no, but no, that, no, 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 run. I think that was smart, though. I, I was doing a risky play. You did the smart way, and you still survived, which was kind of cool. Well, because earlier in the game, when you're trying to, when you get your arm sliced off from uh, from Dimitrescu in the dungeon, uh, mm-hmm. which we forgot to discuss that part, you get your arm sliced off, and then you just attach it with like you know more healing fluid. You're just like, oh, well, that's back on. Seems, seems fine to me. Who needs transplants? Uh, we should say quote unquote healing fluid. But yeah. yes, uh, but. As that was uh, taking place with everything that was happening with the um, uh, the chase with Dimitrescu, the, the the lever that you pull when you're trying to get out of that area is a very slow opening gate, which gives her time to get you. You can't mm-hmm. just, like, sit there. You have to wait for the gate to open all the way. And I figured it was going to be the same case with the fetus, where you couldn't just stand there waiting for it, otherwise it would get you. It was going to force you to have to make another run. That actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, we should mention, too, that that whole part with Lady D, it sets you up in the capacity that it's just a, a complete surprise. Because she throws you through the floor, and she's like, I'll hunt you down, Ethan Winters. And then you open up a crank, and then all of a sudden she's right next to you cutting your arm off. It's like, wow, I didn't expect it that fast. Well, she really did hunt me down. Yeah, she, didn't, she did not play around. But, um, yeah, I could see that false sense of security. <laughs> And then even creepier as as you close the elevator doors and still crying for you um, to try to get you. It's it's as creepy as all hell. Oh, yeah. Right at the breast of the elevator. It's unsettling. And then I I was just wondering if, like, I I could take the elevator back down afterwards. No. Like, not even the game is like, no, we're not going back down there either. (laughs) Well, and again, that's something we're going to have to uh, talk about after we describe the boss fight, quote unquote, boss fight again. Uh, I think this might be one of the weakest portions of the game, aside from the fetus, because you do have to fight Angie and Donna Beneviento. But what I found out was that they didn't randomize Angie's locations. Yeah, she's just in the same spots every time. Basically, what it is is the house is full of dolls, and they're controlled. Well, we'll say that at this point they're controlled. And they can hurt you, they can stab you, whatever. If you don't find Angie the doll fast enough, when she, when you do find her, you stab her in the head three times, end of game. And then you learn to find out that the whole time you've been stabbing Donna in the head. And then later on in a file, you find out that with Donna found out being in House Beneviento, where she's stationed at in the game, is that in the file, it explains she's been using uh, the power of a plant to give people hallucinations and then she figured out how to use those hallucinations against people to make it seem like the doll was flying around when really it's just her controlling it and standing right next to it which you know doesn't really make a whole lick of sense but it's fine for the game but here's the thing 
was the fetus real or was it another hallucination? And it's never, ever explained. Only in the fact that there are experiments going on with a quote unquote uh, molded babies, but you're never known if that's a molded baby fetus thing that just happened to come out or is it a D- Donna Beneviento hallucination? Well, considering that it can eat you, I would think, well, how did it get down there? Like, where was right. it the entire time? Where was it? Yeah. And it just kind of appears. But the, the logic behind the other things, like, if, for instance, when you're in the boss fight, uh, the logic that the dolls are stabbing you is that she's controlling the dolls. And right. so she can she could be the one affecting you and stabbing you. But with the fetus eating you, how how else do you justify it other than the fact that, that it was a monster that was down there? Right. But then how, like, where is it explained how that thing exists? What is it? Or is it just supposed to be, you read that file where they were experimenting and trying to create basically an Eevee baby, which is revealed actually early on uh, that they're kind of the ones who helped cultivate the mold it in a sort of way or are wanted to. And we'll get to spoilers later how it ties to the whole series. But yeah, there's there's that. So I think it's real, but it's never explained. I think it's it's real as well, only because of the fact that it, it can kill you uh, in one in one bite. Basically, it's it's pretty freaking horrific, and it's pretty amazing for all of that. <laughs> but uh, the only way it makes sense of it killing you in that one shot is if, or if it's eating you, is if it is real. Other than that, it, it can't be for the sake of. Uh, it doesn't fit the narrative of how it could try to hurt you like the dolls can with the stabbing and Donna actually being behind it. Right. So if Capcom or anyone else is like revealed like, oh, it's totally fake or it's totally real, like, okay, that's fine. But in the game, it's not revealed. Right. It's left ambiguous. And then, you know, just because we have so much to talk about to continue with, after you get through House Beneviento, the next one you're going to be moving on to is House Moreau. And this one can be the most frustrating part of it um, because you're going through basically two different sections really uh there's a cave base section and then there's the waterway base section um you can easily get turned around in the caves it's a it's a tired very tired old video game kind of trope at this point in time location that you're always going to go to oh you're going to wander around these caves in the mines and all this stuff and you do and what I find more interesting about this section, I guess why I wish this was padded out longer in a different way, is that Moreau is really interesting as one of the lords. In that he is possibly uh, mentally handicapped in some way, and that his brain development has been addled somehow by this kind of uh, mutation that he's gone through and been forced through. So he's kind of like a, uh, I'm trying to find the gentle way to put it, because you don't want to say that he's uh, got like some sort of developmental disability, Mm -hmm. but he seems to have been mentally and emotionally stunted as an an adult with a developmental disability to where he, he can't function properly and he's socially very awkward. He doesn't function well around the other uh, lords. And he's constantly trying to win the praise of his mother. He's basically Liza Minnelli. And <laughs> like, Mama, Mama, can you hear me? <laughs> Going, <laughs> looking for Judy Garland. Uh, but that's, he, he has these serious mother issues and that he views Mother Miranda as an actual mother. And he's constantly trying to win her approval because he has no sense of self-worth. And everybody else like picks on him. Yeah, I I almost kind of hate to say he's a nerd in his own respect, but the bigger thing is that it's weird because every house in some way owns a really, like, scary superior power, even Monroe. And even through learning, like, how he can transform, all of them can, uh, he's he's exceptionally, like, terrifying. In in his own right of water-based creatures, like, growing up, uh, getting into the ocean 
terrified of opening your eyes underwater and seeing this huge thing at the bottom of the ocean looking back at you. Mm-hmm. He's that type of terrifying. And I could see that. Uh, funny enough, fun fact, uh, reading the files of the games, he was supposed to also be... Um, he was supposed to be having trouble with um, gaining companionship so that when you find out later what's on his back, it's his girlfriend. Oh, he's kind of an incel. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, oh, wow. And then it helps. It actually was supposed to like scream at you along with him as if he's controlling her while he's mutating and stuff like that. So it goes into a whole other thing, which I'm glad they didn't use. But at the end of the day, I would say the most frustrating part about him is that the path, uh, pathways with him are a little bit troublesome or they can yes. be. Yes. Yeah. Did you have trouble with that? Because I didn't watch you play that portion. There were parts where it was just like um, poor timing. Like I'd be trying to cross this area and not realizing the the time frame on the certain pathways that you have to travel across. And I keep getting knocked into the water or I get stuck on like a small corner and get knocked into the water. It's like, Jesus Christ. Um, Because it was, there's no, again, it's one of those places where there's no margin for error. If you get knocked into the water, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So... That part was a little frustrating, and it, it was it was a good it was a change of pace. I appreciate the change of pace, um, but at the same time, I I wish there was a bit more give and take on it. Uh, I got through it fine enough, and I did enjoy the boss battle with him. I thought the for all the faults that I had with getting through the caverns. I thought that the boss fight was actually really fun in that there was an element of strategy to it that doesn't happen in the other boss fights. It was the most strategic one because you have to be able to avoid him and know that he's going to lunge, uh, know that he has this projectile vomit attack. And also he does the uh, uh, what my my friend Trevor who was watching when I was playing it, uh, he did the ch- what well, Trevor dubbed the chocolate rain attack. A chocolate <laughs> rain <laughs> it's actually like like an acid rain, but it's interesting because there's little parts around that arena where you're fighting him, where there's a little bit of an outcropping of roof where you can hide under it for when he does the acid rain so you don't get damaged by it. So you have to know where those areas are and get under them, otherwise the acid is just going to eat you alive. And I like the fact that it, it had a, a tactical retreat element to it uh, that you had to follow along or you were going to get really messed up. I think my only gripe with this... Uh, cause this is, okay, so Lady D was kind of more of a set piece. You're climbing the tower, mm-hmm. fighting her. She's a dragon. It's fine. Um, you can almost tell when she's getting damaged. And then, uh, Donna B. Viento, you know, super easy boss fight. If yep. you know where to hide go, and seek. You're, you're having, yep, you're Though, having no problem. In, in fairness to that hide and seek, by the way, I should mention that the files do mention that she's emotionally not developed. Like right. she is not, she's emotionally not progressed beyond that of a child. So right. for her to be playing hide and seek uh, as a form of a boss battle might be the only thing that she really knows as a kid. And it makes sense. Like even like her little small dialogue, back, she's like asking you to play with her and stuff. So it makes total sense, but it's very easily detectable to see where she is and blah, blah, blah and so forth. So when you get to Monroe, this is the three of four. Uh, you hope for something different and it definitely delivers in that aspect but at the same time when I was fighting him and later on when I had the infinite grenade launcher I could not tell when he was a- able to be uh, able to take damage or not and that frustrated me. I think it's just when his mouth is open Yeah, when his actual like uh, white uh, like figure is popping out of the mouth Yeah, Yeah, yeah. so that's the only thing that frustrated me about it because obviously when you're speeding a game you want to figure out the best strategy but there'd be long portions where you couldn't do that so but other than that like the first fight kind of crazy um again the acid rain didn't expect that and it actually caught me off guard so yeah cool job capcom yeah but after that uh he's not too hard a boss in my opinion uh just run and shoot when he can yeah, and then before we get to the the final chapter of like boss fights where we go to Heisenberg, uh, there's a few things like other enemies that you encounter. Like there's that one guy in the the, the windmill. Now, 
yeah, kind of like the not the quite the windmill, but there's that that meat processing butcher shop. Oh, you mean the uh, uh, the same boss that's kind of at the graveside to Donna? Yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, like the uh, hammer guy, Hammer Time. Yeah, MC Hammer. Yep. <laughs> We're gonna call that guy too legit. So too legit. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's an interesting fight, big guy. However, as you noted in the first fight, when you can fight him going to uh, <coughs> um, the treasure there for Donna's grave, he, um, the AI is so stupid. It's 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 actually kind of embarrassing in a way. I'm glad you figured it out as I pointed it out. Yeah, it's just, it was really cheap. Um, the second fight, though, when, when you're up against him there, uh, that, that one's a lot better. Um, that one's more fun. And then, yeah. oh, also something that's really creepy. There's a point in time, I think it's before you go to Heisenberg, where you can revisit the, the, the cornfield or the wheat field where the scarecrow is. Yeah, extra wolf. There's an extra fucking wolf in there. And it's it's hard to find him and see him because the way that the hair plays against the wheat offers like this heavy degree of camouflage. It's fucking terrifying if you're trying to fight in that cornfield or wheat field. Don't do it. Yeah. So apparently... And you get this right on the onset of the game. There's this, uh, like, um, head of the wolves that's kind of running the pack. He's like a general that you meet at the beginning with a hammer. And he's a very hairy dude. Everyone's seen it in the demos and the trailers and blah, blah, blah. Apparently, he's not the guy that actually leads the pack, though. And what Webb's describing is the actual wolf. And you run up to it just out of the blue. Just like the other um, sub bosses, like with the hammers that we've talked about just right now, uh, you don't have to fight these guys, but they will just be there at certain points in the game. So if you're like, oh, I'm gonna go explore the village, they'll fucking be there, and you're like, whoa, what what's going on? And this wolf in particular has five times the damage uh, of the other big wolf you meet. The first time you return to the village. Yeah, this guy does damage fast, and he closes the gap on you fast. Oh, he does not give a shit, uh, which I, I kept joking. I was like, wow, that uh, BSAA training really didn't help you that much, Ethan, did it? <laughs> it it's, it's, it's just creepy how quickly he can gain on you. Yeah, I got my ass kicked the first time. I don't know about you. Uh, I did not, uh, but mostly because I just sissied out and kept running back and forth between the shed. I'd, like, pop out of the shed, fire a few times, run back in the shed, um, mm. and kept doing that and was was cheesing it. Um, that, that's I fought a, him in the field. I yeah. did not do that. I just cheesed him. I would go into the shack, fire a couple sniper rifle rounds at him, run back in the shack, and then when I ran out of sniper rifle rounds, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to get up a little bit closer. I'm going to stalk this son of a bitch. I'm going to stalk him. I'm going to get up close to him with a magnum. I'm going to fire three rounds into his face. And I did, and he, he died. Now I'll stick his thumb, my thumb, up his butthole. Up his cloaca. Yep. But no, I, I, that's how I effectively dealt with him. Uh, and then, after having cleared out the rest of the village and whatnot, then it was on to Hobo Nicholas Cage. But I, I have to ask before we move on, did you appreciate those sub-bosses, or were you kind of like it didn't really need to be in the game? I appreciated them. I appreciated them. They, they were needed, because the game doesn't have many bosses. Um... The ones that it has are great, but it, they're they're lacking in terms of the number. So you have to make up for them with something else to, to like do a drip feed in the meantime. And that's where those uh, the smaller bosses came into play and were quite a bit of fun. Yeah, a little bit more replay value and, you know, it's a step up from the Baker family, we should say. Yes. Uh, but, mm. yeah, and then, you know, just like other... It seems to be the, the trend in most Resident Evil games... You're always going to end up in an area that is more technologically advanced than other areas that you've been to. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of weird how this plays out because Heisenberg gives you the last uh, embryo, basically part of Rose to put into this, um, what's it called? This little pillar where it, it basically formed the umbrella logo and then you I'm guessing Ethan just picks this pillar up and hauls it over down the road and he puts it in this other um, little uh, indented part into the ground and it unlocks a bridge to the factory. And I gotta say, I know we might disagree on this part. I gotta say, the factory 
least favorite part of the game, and not only that, but a ridiculous maze that didn't need to happen. Boy, I did not like the uh, the factory either. It was the worst part. Um, mm-hmm. You're right. It is needlessly complicated as a maze. Uh, there's different floors to it, which just seem jumbled and unnecessary. Uh, that's one of the things I hate about high-tech parts of the games. Like in Resident Evil 3, I think it is, uh, there's that section where you had to go all around with the crane puzzles and the lifts. Crane puzzles and Not the, the crane, lifts. but there's a bunch of lifts. Like you have to, you're in like a warehouse and you've got these lifts that you have to keep cranking up so that you reach different heights of the platforms. And you're oh, walk- yeah. I hated that. I fucking hate that maze. Yeah, that's my least favorite part of there, too. Yeah, I just read that stuff. So things like that kind of really pissed me off. And this, this area had that kind of pissed off feeling to it for me. Was not happy. Did not like it. Um, yeah. But I did kind of enjoy fighting some of the the enemies there. Uh, I like the 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 fear factor they almost kind of reminded me of like when you get to like the regenerators in a sense from um uh resident evil 4 even though these guys are not as scary as the regenerators were by any means but these yeah. like cyborg zombie things where you have to like strike the core the glowing red core of them i i'm smirking honestly because i'm like he gets it he gets what i'm thinking as well exactly and they, they had a they could be annoying when they were coming at you in multiple ones but at the same time they posed a legitimate threat um that you had to find another way of trying to fight them. Like you couldn't just fight them like you could anything else. So I, I liked them, but at the same time, it was, uh, it was a legitimate, legitimate threat. Even though uh, sometimes they just came, they weren't scary. That's the problem. They weren't really scary. They're just like, oh, God damn it, not another one. Didn't feel the the design of the character didn't feel very revolutionary. It was more like uh, something out of I want to say like Doom Three or Quake Four mm-hmm. or something like that. It was it was kind of like a character out of that. It didn't I don't want to say it didn't feel Resident Evil. Uh, you know what? Here's a better way to explain it. It felt like that dude with the um, metal arm out of Sylvester Stallone's Judge Dread. <laughs> I can uh, see that. Yeah, I forget his name. He's- but yeah, they weren't they weren't super scary or anything. Again, the maze portion of this very shitty. Uh, I do not look forward going through it again. But what was what was one of the coolest portions of the whole game was the fact that when you first walk into the factory and you see the bodies on the assembly line, and you see how great the RE engine works when given a set piece. I mean, it was so beautiful. Even in the trailer, when I saw like a split second of it, I was like, wow, that looks great. Yeah. And being able to stand there and just stare at it, I'm still like, wow, that's. They put a... somebody put a lot of time into that. And I don't know if it was an art director that, that set... was the onset of uh, placing that there or it was somebody coming up with it, but it, it's just beautiful. It's It's great. And eventually, you have to work your way through all of that that factory. And once you do get through the gorgeous set pieces, um, you eventually encounter an old friend, Chris Redfield. Fun fact to mention, Chris Redfield is played by the guy in RE3 remake who said, Huh, weird fucking door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's voice a weird actor. fucking door. Yeah, that's a weird fucking door. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my favorite uh, lines. <laughs> no, I, I was like, I'm going to bring this up. Uh, uh, the guy who did Carlos in RE3 remake uh, does Chris in here. Well, it, he sounds... I mean, Capcom has never been really good about reusing the same voice actors for the most part. Um, mm-hmm. Except for, for DC yeah. Douglas for Wesker. And what's her name for Claire? Oh my god, how am I forgetting her name? Hold on, I gotta look this up. <laughs> Uh, But while you're doing that, I'll note that, uh, so Chris finally comes clean about a lot of what's going on. He's told you about, or he tells you about what happened with why he shot Mia, and that it was actually uh, Mother Miranda in disguise. He was trying to put her down for good. Um, And the reason why he didn't tell Ethan about it all is because he didn't know if Ethan was compromised too, because of how close Mother Miranda got. So he was just trying to take them all in as best and quickly as possible to try to just put an end to it without Ethan resisting or trying to uh, essentially put up any kind of a fight. Um, and the plan would have worked if it wasn't for the fact that the convoy that was carrying Ethan and Rose got attacked. And that's where Rose was kidnapped and everything happened from there. 
So right. Chris regrets it uh, to an extent, uh, but he's giving Ethan a chance to fight back and make it up to him by giving him a tank kind of thing. <laughs> This is uh, this is literally where I remember that scene from Army of Darkness where he he, he rigs his car with a huge, uh, basically a chopper fan, and he's like, "Welcome to the 21st century." This is literally that. That's all it is. Speaking of chopper fan, we've avoided talking about the the boss fight before this with the uh, propeller dude. Yeah, he's uh, not a good boss fight. Weird boss fight. Man. Well, the, the only thing that threw me off on that boss fight was I couldn't kill him the first time, and I realized, well, the reason why I didn't kill him is because you have to keep up the pressure on him. You can't let him over. You can't let him uh, blow off the heat from the fan. You have to kill him while he's in overheat status. All right. You have to shoot him in a weak spot in the back. Well, yeah, I knew that part, but um, like I kept, I went through so many bullets. Uh, but the problem was you had to keep being aggressive while he's overheating, and if he expels all the overheat, it, re it restarts everything. You have to try it again. So you just have to keep up the pressure. And before we go on, I should mention it was Allison Court who did uh, Claire Red Redfield the most in all the RE games. Sadly, she ended on Operation Raccoon City. Not a good game. Uh, but she also did voice Lydia and Jubilee in Beetlejuice and X-Men. So you might recognize her voice. There you go. I would say that overall, the factory was the weakest part of the game. Heisenberg, you don't even get to see him transform. I'm sorry, Magneto. Right. It just, it literally, like, they, I don't want to say they got lazy, but the door shuts, or all these things, all this metal pieces come over you, you don't get to see him transform, and then when he reveals he's just this hideous monster for all of a sudden, no reason. But you get to fight him in a tank. Yeah, but, I don't know, I have to see how that plays on the later difficulties, if it's hard or not. Well, all I can say is that it is the most non-re part of the game it's very re6 almost it, it's yes pretty much um so you know it is what it is it's, it's another action set piece which can be frustrating for for those who don't want those but you know you, you just pour through it and uh shoot the rocket launcher that you got the machine gun uh and just you know da -da 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 -da, and eventually he blows up and you know heisenberg his motivations are interesting uh, because he wanted to use Rose as a weapon to overthrow Mother Miranda. He really does not like Mother Miranda. Mm -hmm. And he wanted, and you get the sense that if he, if Ethan had agreed with him, he had no, no bone to pick with Ethan. Yes and no, because he wanted to use Ethan to take down Mother Miranda, but he also wanted to use Ethan to take over the world. <laughs> right, so... but if you agreed with him, then he wouldn't have had a problem with you is what I'm saying. Yeah, and there's this really, um, I don't want to say ridiculously stupid uh, set piece segment where Ethan literally is sat down in a chair by Heisenberg where behind him, he knows this, is this trap hole where he's going to have to find something. Yeah, why, why something. do you fucking yeah. sit in the chair right there next to the edge of the, the hole? That was ridiculous. I, yeah, and he even comments on it. He's like, I don't care. I can handle it. And it's like, yeah, you can, but I really don't want to do that if I don't have to. Come on. Yeah, stop sitting right on the edge of the where you can easily be kicked in. Yeah. And when he, when he did get kicked in, I think even when I was playing the game, I was like, well, Ethan, you, you just flat out deserved that. And so, again, the factory, weakest part of the game, in my opinion. Uh, Monroe, second, and then it's uh, it's like literally going backwards. I still think Lady D in the castle, again, my favorite part, like the Baker House. But that's just my opinion. Everyone's mileage may vary. Well, now we start getting to plot elements here as uh, Mother Miranda rips out Ethan's heart and destroys it this part took me by surprise i was like what i i'm such a sucker i was like what that's it <laughs> did you get that way um i didn't know what was going to happen um i was it was a little ridiculous seeing it all play out and thinking to myself this is <sighs> he's she's literally ripped his heart out i don't know what to expect at this point in time um <laughs> but obviously after that we get to see you start playing as chris uh, which is interesting. It's like, okay, well, we will finish the job with Chris. And it's nice, that change of pace. It's it's pretty fun seeing 
the way you can tackle these monsters with automatic weapons and just tearing through them. And then as that's all happening, we get to switch back to things that are happening with Ethan's consciousness, which is still there. And the fact that he's apparently not dead. Yeah, Evie shows up, uh, Eveline, and she explains basically that Ethan's a molded and he can't die, at least in this context of having his molded heart ripped out, which, again, uh, I'm not sure if I'm on board for. It's kind of weird, because does that mean that he was taken over by the molded in his time in RE7? Okay. All right, that makes sense. But then why wasn't he controlled, which is the whole point of that? So I'm not sure how to feel about it. I think the the point was that he was so strong-willed that he couldn't get controlled. Like, it was just preventing him from being controlled. I think that's what the whole point of it was. Uh, his will was somehow strong enough, and that's what made him special, unique, and threatening uh, mm -hmm. to everybody. I think that's kind of the point. But... I think that's also why he's a legend, because everybody knows about him. Because if the if the mold has kind of like a hive mind consciousness, then everybody knows about him and how he couldn't be controlled. Right. Uh, and that, that would concern them all, given the fact that control is a huge element of what what this mold does, how this mold operates. So I think that's a, what that's about. That's my guess. Yeah. In Ari in general. And it does reveal later if you do some of the side areas, which there are a ton of. If you're going to explore this game, there are a ton of side areas. But there's a laptop you find where it reveals uh, that there are molded um, who cannot be controlled. And I guess we're just going to have to take it that yeah, Ethan is one of them. Yeah, that seems to be the case. It's an interesting... I like the fact, because uh, it makes sense in a way... Uh, I like the, the callback that they did to like when she's like Jack killed you, and when you look reflect back on what you know Ethan went through and, and what Jack did to him, it's like you can see where he would accidentally kill him. It's very Metal Gear Solid, actually. It's like <laughs> you killed him. It's like, no, sorry. It's like you killed him. What were you thinking, Ocelot? I don't know, boss. I didn't mean to. Do you know what this is? It's the Colt Single Action Army. Six bullets. More than enough to kill anything that moves. That would be the problem. You killed him while he was moving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, next time I won't make that mistake. But it's it's very Metal Gear Solid. Like, you know, you know Jack killed you by accident. Uh, but it explains why you were able to, like, reattach your arm to yourself so easily. This is just me, like... Moving around the autopsy lights while you do your Metal Gear impression. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Stay tuned for my this will be my one man Metal Gear show at some point in time. <laughs> I can't wait. Otacon. I can't wait till we do something Metal Gear. <laughs> Otacon, what's going on with that man with the arm? I don't know, Snake. Normally people can't reattach arms like that. <laughs> Seems a little weird to me. It's weird to me too, Snake. Snake, I have a question. What is it, Otacon? Do you feel that love can bloom on the battlefield when you only have one hand? Uh, these questions are getting weirder and weirder, Otacon. I gotta go. <laughs> but yeah, so... <laughs> you know, I gotta put on my headphones, Snake. <laughs> kinder, gentler machine gun hand. <laughs> <laughs> kinder, gentler machine gun. Thank you, Neil Young. <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that as we get to closing in on this, uh, we do find out that apparently uh, Mother Miranda has ties back to the the origins of Umbrella. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, biggest reveal. As I was reading those letters, I kept thinking, OK, I called it. I almost kind of called this, but the way they revealed it felt very organic and I was happy. And uh, basically what happens, Spencer met Mother Miranda. She had the mold it. He had an idea for how to use the plant in Africa. And uh, they eventually came to the conclusion that 
Spencer wanted to basically reach immortality. And Mother Miranda kind of wanted to evolve man and help people. And at the end of the day, she went mad, he went mad, and it didn't work out. That's what happened. And and from what I gathered, unless you have a different conclusion, Web. No, I mean, it's basically essentially something as simple as, okay, there was science uh, that was supposed to lead people on a certain path. And they differed in the interpretation of how to use that science, which happens all the time. And just like other medications and products have been made from nature, so too do we have something like this in the sense of most of what we've seen and has happened through the T-virus, all that stuff, uh, basically comes back from the studying of this mold. Like, there's other factors that have been tied to, like things that were uh, the Las Plagas, but essentially... All the scientific knowledge that was going towards the T virus comes from mold and studies of mold. Right. So the mold it were something that Mother Miranda found out. The Las Plagas were a crustacean that was discovered the year that it happened, I believe in 2004, with Leonis Kennedy and in the village. And then the T virus was figured out in the seventies, but it was experimented on, on uh, leeches, and then became fully what it was later on down the line in the nineties, and then so on and so forth. The G virus was the cultivation of the T virus. It just it just evolves, but the thing about it was is that uh, Spencer wasn't the creator of uh, uh, cultivating the T virus. That was um, the other guy in RE Zero. God, why does his name escape me? Probably because he's not important. <laughs> <laughs> he really isn't. And then uh, Ashford in Code Veronica X had, was more of a uh, botanist than a geologist and so on and so forth. So these people experimented in different ways, which is exactly what happens in actual science, and which is why Mother Miranda... Uh, it took her 50 years to kind of do these different things. And what she ended up calling it wasn't the molded. It was called the Kadu. And she started off with wolf's blood, which was around her area in Romania. And she used that to experiment on people. And then Lady D took that and experimented on people that served her. Why? Which is every like stalking little enemy in the game is actually a woman which people probably wouldn't know that unless they read the diaries. Every Almost 90% of the enemies in this game are women. And then on top of that, one of the reasons why she did go mad was because she lost her daughter, her very young daughter, to the Spanish flu, uh, which is kind of eerily timely considering everything that's going on with the the pandemic with COVID um, and lost loved ones. But she lost her, her baby daughter to the Spanish flu, and the... I guess the pain of that drove her to a point where the only thing that she cared about was using the science to try to resurrect or find a way to bring back to life her daughter. Yeah, it's pretty sad and pretty tragic, um, but I still feel no remorse for these people. Oh, of course not. You're not, I mean, ideally you should not be feeling remorse for them. They're they're supposed to be terrible people. Um, yeah, especially Mia. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, Mia. But yeah, that, that's where everything is coming into play, is the fact that you have all these people who are experimenting with this technology, most of them that should not be because of the, uh, the, the means of which they are using it for. And in the end, you have to uh, take down Mother Miranda, uh, because Chris is trying to take down the, the actual fungus itself, the mold, that has coalesced into this terrible... Uh, like massive monstrosity of a creature and with that happening uh ethan has crawled his way back to life because he he essentially is just a creature of mold uh that his consciousness is just barely holding it together and you're going to take down mother miranda and i will tell you fortunately unlike in the previous resident evil where the final boss battle was just some scripted bullshit uh this is actually a final boss battle yes and um you know, it kind of plays out okay 
I didn't think it was like I don't know. I didn't think it was like that great, but it the the performance of it is pretty grand. Um and she's not too hard to kill, in my opinion. And I don't know about you, Webb. Well, if you save up the right ammunition for the end, no, she's definitely not hard to kill. But uh the the great part about this is that you kind of feel like Mother Miranda is like basically taking over the um, molded have come out of the ground and we reveal that Chris has his own team, uh, basically like a counter strike team that comes out. That's not affiliated with the BSAA that he's established by himself. And originally these characters were supposed to have their own um, personalities. And this whole thing was supposed to be a huge set piece. They didn't have time to do that. But you get this huge action action scene that's like RE6, and you're just literally blowing through anything that stands in front of you. Uh, the BSAA is um, the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, and it's uh, sanctioned by the United Nations. One of the craziest things that we find out in this game is that the BSAA eventually uses BOWs to help take down Mother Miranda. Mm -hmm. And Chris realizes this and he's like, what? What the hell did the United Nations just do? And it kind of blows my mind that that happened. And he finds this out in the heat of battle. Not not a good place to find it out, but uh, it, it definitely changes and it will change the course of how he views what he's doing. And we're, we're not sure what the implications that are going to be, but that's fine. We're not supposed to know that just yet. Right. It's a trilogy. Right. So we'll find out what happens in the next one, but basically the way it ends is with one of the first deaths of a character, uh, like a main character, in a long time in this series. I'm okay with it. I don't know about you, Web. Like, oh, I'm fine with Ethan dying. Does not matter to me. It's so bizarre how they completely askew his face and just keep it in shadow, like even when it doesn't make any sense. It's like we know what he looks like. We can Google his fucking character model. It's fine. Capcom. The only thing I can think of as to why they're doing it that way is if in another, maybe in the next game, you're going to meet somebody because you'll be playing as a different perspective and you're going to meet somebody with Ethan's face and they're going to count on most people not knowing what Ethan's face looks like. I mean, maybe. That's a possibility. I, like you said, you can look up the character model. But for all intents and purposes, I think most casual players are not going to know what Ethan's face looks like. It's it's so bizarre, though, the way they do it, and I don't know, I think that might be the only thing in the game that kind of, like, took me out of it for a second. It was like, wait, what? What's that? Why is there some weird looming shadow over this guy's face? It's broad yeah. daylight. <laughs> yep, ideally there should have been a scene where it was just, like, showing his face. Um, just, like, right before he blows up. Just show it. And ultimately, he is the one who triggers the explosive that um, destroys the, the fungus, the mold, uh, destroys the rest of the town as well, sends it all basically sky high. And that's that. Because we learned that the Mitami seat of the uh, molded, they're all connected. So basically what they're going to do is invade the world. So they have to take them out. And Chris is not new to this, so he basically goes in there and is like, yeah, I know what to do. All right, let's head out. And... <laughs> Of course, Ethan is like, no, I gotta save my daughter, and that complicates things. But yeah, at the end of the day, they blow that shit up, Ethan dies, which, like you said, Webb, did not care at all. I was like, fine, thankful. <laughs> I'm so glad. Uh, and then it reveals that Mia's still alive in a jail cell, and that Mother Miranda, which we didn't mention, at the beginning of the game... The Mia that Chris shoots is Mother Miranda, who impersonates Mia because she's going to take Rose. And here's the thing with me. How did she find that out? And I started thinking, well, the BSAA is using BOWs now. So did they sell Ethan and Mia out? Is that how that happened? I wonder if it has more to do with the fact that Mia was still taking medications for the infection, so she may still have had a connection to the mold to where uh, they were able to track her down and like come up with a plan. And I guess Mother Miranda's plan, the 
the most like the ease of uh, difficulty, I guess you could say, uh, was once they had a kid to infiltrate and then take the baby by impersonating uh, Mia. I think that she was able to keep tabs on them from the fact that Mia was still connected to the mold. That's possible. That's very possible. And uh, also the old lady in the village who... I'm not sure why Mother Miranda would impersonate her, but she does. And she keeps giving you, like, weird hints and being around you. And I guess she's just keeping a watchful eye. But we also learned that the crows flying over you are also Mother Miranda. So it's this whole thing where she's just always there. She's like Freddy Krueger or something. I don't know. But she's just always there. And uh, going back to it, when you play it again, it's like, that's Mother Miranda. I've been around her the whole time. Also, I think the other thing, too, with it all is Mother Miranda, I I don't know if it was intentional. Like, she, Heisenberg suggests that Mother Miranda was purposely trying to use you to kill off the other houses. Right. So that could be why she was posing as the old woman, too, is to guide you along the way um, in some subtle way without fully communicating it to you who she is for the sake of being able to essentially eliminate everybody else and I guess harness their powers or harness your power for the sake of the mold. Yeah, because I think she's trying to cultivate like an army of Evies or Evelines and then obviously they need like a dad figure or Rosewood. So I'm guessing part of the army dilute it down. I don't know. Why would she have any purpose for Rosewood? <laughs> Speaking of Rose, though, uh, after the game concludes, we do get to see that Rose has grown up, um, but we don't know like how much of a time span has come since uh, the end of the game, because uh, with Rose being kind of a unique child born of the mold, uh, her aging pattern might not be the same as a normal person's. Right. It's not uh, specifically made aware of to the player... You know, I didn't hate it at all. It was just kind of like, okay, cool. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens in the third game. It's an epilogue, basically. Yeah, basically is. Uh, but it's a nice little epilogue to show that from whatever happens, like Rose is listed as essentially she's a, a B.O.W. And Chris is aware of it and is having her watch because she starts to act up out of anger when... For whatever reason, this is stupid writing. Just uh, the dick agent that's handling her is like, what do you say, Evelyn? And she's like, my name is Rose. So like, why, why is he purposely trying to irritate her? Yeah, it makes no sense. No, it doesn't. Probably the only good thing out of that callback is that we get to see that originally Chris, when Ethan handed uh, Rose to him, he put her in his jacket. So in this epilogue, we see Rose all grown up in his jacket. And it still has the cut where Lady D cut off his arm. It's all stitched together. Like his arm in RE7 on the other side. So it's kind of like transition from left to right. And now, mm -hmm. you know, she's taken over. It's this weird little subtle thing. But I appreciated that, that they included it. And, um... I don't know. I don't hate the ending. I, I actually don't even hate this game. Let's put it that way. Let's let's get to <laughs> the conclusion. I don't hate it. I sh I, I on the outset, I was lukewarm. Just lukewarm. Yeah, just lukewarm. What? Like the inside of a tauntaun. Oh, <laughs> I thought they smelled bad on the outside. <laughs> What's the internal temperature of a tauntaun? Lukewarm. <laughs> it's it's a bad joke, but. Now, there's a lot that we covered here, I and mean, this was a two-hour episode of this podcast that was discussing all the intricacies of Resident Evil Village, but there's there's definitely so much to uncover with this in terms of what it means for the lore, um, for the memorable characters. I would, I know it's not possible, but I would love to see some of these characters return, like uh, trying to find another way to use uh, Lady, uh, Lady D, whether it be in DLC or... Uh, some kind of, uh, I don't want to say a spin-off, but I would love to see more of her character. I'd love to see Heisenberg uh, out more as well, outside of the factory stuff. Like, there's some really interesting characters here, and I, I wish we could utilize them a bit better 
in some ways. But who knows what the future will hold for the series after this. My only concern is that, you know, there's a pattern that Capcom follows. Resident Evil 1, survival horror. Resident Evil 2, more survival horror, but bigger, better, some more action in there, but it hits like the sweet spot. Resident Evil 3... Far more action-focused, really. Uh, I even talked about the original. Like, the original is still more action-focused with recurring encounters, ability to, like, do an emergency dodge, things that more actionize the gameplay. Uh, and kind of took it a little bit out of survival horror as opposed to the first two games. You know what I mean? It uh, gave more breath to action sets, yes. Yeah. So that might have been a bit too far for some people. Code Veronica... And Code, or Code Veronica X, depending on how you phrase it. Kind of its own thing. Um, and then Resident Evil 4. Action. Resident Evil 5. Even more action. Resident Evil 6. Even more, more action. <laughs> like, again, cool. they got too far. Resident Evil 7. Survival horror. Resident Evil 8. Survival horror more with more action. What happens with Resident Evil 9 when it comes out? Like, are they going to uh -huh. go too far again? Because they keep repeating the cycle where the third game is arguably far too action-oriented each time. This is something I brought up to Webb, too, when we were discussing this game vaguely uh, before the podcast, is that I kind of feel like this game took all all of it, all the, all the steps that every Resident Evil presented forward, it kind of has everything. It has the spooky mansion, it's a castle, it has something chasing you, Mr. X, Lady D. You know, it has something that you can't see, uh, something that you, uh, the puzzles that, um, you know, take you out of your comfort zone, something chasing you, something unkillable, and so many other games. Uh, it has the action set pieces. It has characters that are over the top. It has set pieces that are over the top, like RE6. Maybe not that bad, but. It has a little bit of everything. So if anyone is ever like, oh, it's this one thing, it's not. It's the whole series. And I think that's why it works. But it's not without criticism. I think that if you're going to play this game, you have to go into it knowing that there are going to be scares, but there's also going to be action. And, you know, uh, the puzzles aren't that deep. So... <laughs> Don't worry about that. Yeah. Now, for a score, it can be hard to score games like this. But if you had to assign a score to Resident Evil Eight, what would you what would you give it? <clears throat> At, on the outset of it, when I did my first playthrough, it was uh, eight, a hard eight, only in that first playthrough. Having replayed it, I think it would still stick to that because. You can see that um, there was work put into this. Every setting, nothing was left on the ground floor. Everything was thought about. Um, the character flows better. The set pieces, the characters, the thoughts put into the puzzles were a little bit more streamlined, but they weren't obscure to the fact that, you know, it's it's not a uh, re fucking dead aim levels or something stupid like that right uh yeah but there were a couple of segments that let me down and i'm not sure if it's because they were later segments that they just ran out of time again the vertical slice did they start at the beginning and they worked off that how is the production on it a book can be made out of it there was one made on resident evil 7 it's called the document file it explains it so i'm not sure what they did with this game in development but at the end of it, you can sort of feel like a rush. And if that's the case, then it makes sense why that plays out the way it does. Aside from that, how would I rate it? Again, hard eight. What about you, Webb? Probably run eight as well. Um, maybe an 8.5 if we're doing decimals. Uh, because I like the more action-oriented gameplay as opposed to the more horror-oriented. I, I felt compelled to want to replay the game again right after finishing it. Uh, and utilizing infinite ammo and one of my uh, weapons I picked up to be able to feel more at home with slaughtering enemies by the score. It's great. Um, start to dive into mercenaries mode, which is going to require a lot of practice if I want to get those double S ratings on it. 
Oh, uh, yeah. It, it felt good to dive back in, and I very much enjoyed what was presented. I've made my qualms about it pretty clear over the course of the podcast, and there's nothing more that I would have to say about that aside from the fact that, you know, overall, did I have a fun time? I had a fun time. Does that count for a lot? Yeah, it really does. So, 8.5. Do you feel like the game is worth the money you paid for it? I don't know if you got the deluxe version or... Uh, I did get the deluxe version, and yeah, I, I feel it was worth the money. I mean, my first playthrough was 11 and a half hours, which is about par for the course for some people. So, it was worth the money for me because I want to go back and replay it. Yeah, it felt more worthwhile than Resident Evil 3 did, tell you that much. Yeah, I agree on that. Uh, cut content, man, what a killer. Um, the actual killer. Uh, what What do you think though about the 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 actual deluxe content that you got? Because I didn't get it. I tried to go around fucking scour everywhere. I did it last minute because I'm an idiot, and I couldn't get it. Even more so, I saw a collector's edition this week that was on GameStop's website. I could have bought it, and I didn't have the money. I mean, I did, but being responsibly, I, you know, being responsible, I didn't have it. But, and then it sold out. I was so angry. But when you got the deluxe content, did you feel like Capcom gypped you? Yeah. At that point in time, it's just like, yeah, it's an extra $10, whatever. Like, <laughs> this is kind of how <laughs> I feel about it. Uh, but that's I, a trip to Taco Bell for like eight times. No, I'm just kidding. I know. But yeah, no, I I talked to a friend. He's like, oh, yeah, I got this and I got that. He's like, wow, it's kind of useless. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it sounds useless. I could change the save room music. That's something. <laughs> to go tell Aunt Ruddy that thing you heard in the last game? Yeah, it's a callback. <laughs> I'm just curious because I, I've been looking at it. I could buy it and I'm like, ah, is it worth it? I mean, it's it's your call. Is it really worth it? Probably, probably not. But is it just something to say you have it? And it's, yeah, yeah, we got it. Yeah, you're a Resident Evil fan, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean that's a comprehensive review of yeah. the whole entire game. I mean, we covered the whole thing. I I can't think of one thing we left out. I mean, you did make small notes of things, but that's kind of good because you. You know, they're meant to be figured out. So. Yeah, we covered so much of it that, that we're good. And I do hope that people who enjoy the franchise and are a little weary about the first person just continue to give this a shot. Because it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I did... <laughs> I shouldn't mention this. I did challenge Webb to a game debate episode. I said, we gotta do RE6. And he agreed to it. So at some point, that will happen. Yes, at some point we'll cover RE6. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. We only have so few minutes to talk about it, so <laughs> I can't wait. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, but for the time being, uh, this was a lot of fun covering this game over the last two hours. So thank you, Stefan, for uh, being prepared for the conversation after plowing through the game and being here with me as a, as a friend, a colleague, and a Resident Evil aficionado. Yeah, I worked 12 hours today, so to anyone feels like I'm tired as fuck, I am. But <laughs> I had a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I thank everybody for listening, and hopefully you can leave your comments on what you thought of Resident Evil Village here. Uh, we thank you very much for tuning in and enjoying this with us. And leave your thoughts about the game, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you would like to see, what you would like to see for the sequel coming up, which, of course, there's going to be another one. I wouldn't be surprised. And Love to hear just the overall opinions. Uh, this is a great game to discuss because there are some positives and negatives, which always makes for good conversation. Uh, so, Stefan, thank you again, my friend. Yeah, thanks for being here, everyone. Yes. So from us here at the Crypt of the Unknown, please make sure to check us out on social media. You can find me at the Critical Android, or you can email me at thecriticalandroid at gmail.com, or just find me on Twitter at Critical Android. Stefan, where can they find you? And I am Cyberpunk Holiday on Instagram. Come say hello. Yes, we'd be gra uh, glad to hear from you all, and even more grateful for just the continued sharing and liking of our podcasts. So from us here at the Crypt of the Unknown, we thank you all once again for listening and watching. And until next time, the Crypt is closed. Stop shouting, you 
draw the monsters. Always got to have that stinger in there, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Winters, the, the hunger <laughs> is to live. 